Hello and welcome to Curated Spaces, the podcast that explores the stories behind spaces reimagining how we stay, work and play. Join me, Molly Cooper, as I sit down with founders, owners and thought leaders to hear about their journey of bringing a space to life. Great spaces shape our lives. They inspire, nurture and connect us. But most importantly, they bring us together to share life's milestones with the people who mean the most to us. So whether you're a traveller, foodie or design seeker, join us as we celebrate the power of spaces and the brilliant people behind them. So this week I'm in Cornwall at Nuncarrow Farm, a working farm that's been cared for for over nine generations of the same family. Today, as well as cows, orchards and vegetable patches, it has a collection of gorgeous barns and converted farm buildings that host weddings, events and farm feasts. I'm joined by Steve to hear all about his journey of turning this farm into the space it is today with community and sustainability at its heart. Steve, welcome to Curator Spaces. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. Now, before we dive into the space, I'd love to hear a bit about your story, where you come from, life before Nankaro. Wow, yeah. So um, in my former life, I, I spent about 11 years or 12 years um, working up in the London area, uh, working for, I suppose, more uh, the kind of... Um, commercial um, brands that you might kind of expect. Um, uh, yeah, all over the Southeast, very much had that commuter lifestyle. Um, I wore a shirt and a tie to work, um, managed lots of people and always had my eye on moving down West and and taking something on where we could really build something from scratch and, and, and you know, follow our passion really. And um, it took a little while to come to fruition. Um, we had plans to move down and those you know had to be put on hold for a few years but we moved down in 2011 with a six month year old little boy who's now 12 years old nearly 13 um and you know quickly settled and then got stuck in really amazing and could you tell us a bit about where we are in the world so we are um near truro which is the capital city of, of cornwall uh, that's just four miles away so we are um i suppose right smack bang in this center of cornwall so about half an hour from Padstow, just over half an hour from Penzance, um, about four hours, five hours from London. Gorgeous. Um, on if the weather's, if the traffic's okay. <laughs> and actually I was driving here today. It is so gorgeous. Little country lanes, little glimpse of the sea. It's beautiful. It feels a million miles we from are, London. Yeah. Particularly this week, we are very, very lucky to be in Cornwall for sure. Yeah, the sun is shining mm. today. Now tell me about Nankaro, because you were telling me 240 years it's been in your wife's family. That's right, yeah. I'd love to hear about that history. Yeah, well, we've only, um, it, it took us a while to sort of uncover the full history because actually, um, you know, much like any family business, stuff does get a little bit lost mm -hmm. in, in, in sort of the archive, so to speak. So we uncovered some of the documents and there's this wonderful painting up at the farmhouse as well of um, Oliver Adams Carveth, mm -hmm. who purchased the farm in 1782. Wow. So um, we've got all of those records and then we've sort of pieced together a bit of family history too. And um, yeah, luckily um, Lucy's grandfather, Gordon, who's no longer with us, but before he died, passed on loads of amazing uh, stories, which, you know, offered like mm -hmm. a window into the past. Yeah. And, and that's very much, uh, it fills you with a sense of pride, obviously, yeah. because you feel totally actually connected to some of those things that are very different to how we live, live in the world yeah. now. And um, we've always felt passionate about something that's got that history. It's, it's been worked on with, you know, the correct sentiments. Um, it, you know, there's lots of businesses who it's about shareholders and returns mm -hmm. and all those sort of things. And, and this is actually about, um, you know, generational kind of legacy and environmental legacy. Yeah. And, and we really wanted to build on that. The um, Pete, my father-in-law, um, he converted the farm to organics in uh, well 90, uh, 25 years ago, so 1998, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and um, was one of the sort of pioneers of the sort of farmers market sort of movement. Um, so we had uh, a farmers market stall selling meat and veg. Um, we delivered firewood. We had an honesty stall on the roadside, um, and always had that kind of customer facing sort of brand, I suppose. Um, and uh, being sort of an early adopter to the whole organic movement, you know, led people who sort of, um, people who kind of valued where their food came from and, and how that kind of interacted with the environment. We had a loyal base of customers already um, and worked really, really hard, um, you know, going from field to farmer's market stall. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, those relationships we built were really the kind of mainstay of how Nankara fitted into the kind of community in Cornwall. Um, the farmer's markets are, have their limitations, particularly in Cornwall, where there's only, you know, so many people yeah. within a sphere around around those cities or towns. Um, and, yeah, we, we, we cracked on for 16 years doing those. We tried street food. We tried ways mm. of making it more viable. Um, and then realised that actually when you're sort of sat on a farmer's market stall outside Primark or Weatherspoons, the people who are kind of passing aren't necessarily people who are grabbing that organic mm. piece of meat. Yeah. Uh, they might actually be slightly intimidated or feel they've, you know, it's out of their reach or whatever. So, so um, uh, we kind of decided actually to kind of add that value yeah. and kind of maintain that kind of customer facing brand. We need to bring them here mm. and they can see with their own eyes how it's produced. Yeah. Um, the environment that, that the animals, you know, frequent um, and all the methods that we you know, involved in growing stuff the way it should be, really. Um, and that's been a really, that's been a journey that we've been on in the last sort of 10 years, really. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, we, we now have about 15,000 people who visit the farm every year and they might be coming for a wedding and know nothing about us or they might be passionate about every aspect of what we do yeah. and come you know, a couple of times a month for, yeah. for lunch or dinner. Um, and that's been great building those relationships that have changed over the years. Um, and, you know, in many cases, actually, it's the children of the people who used to buy meat from Pete who now come. Which is uh, so brilliant, and, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, that's, that's very much the goal. It's what I say to the team when, when they first join us or when we have our, one of our annual meetings. I think we've got an opportunity as a farm to be a real pillar of the community. And if you imagine there's a, couple who get married and they may get married at the farm and then they have children and they're able to bring them back they get to school age and then they can then come for school visits um and that that can kind of keep going and actually it's perfectly feasible to have a relationship with a family mm -hmm. for an entire generation exactly. and that's, that, that's absolutely our goal and i love the little touches of your family like we're sat here in in the barn the old mill the old mill the yeah. old mill and behind you there's the stamp uh, box collection the matchbox collection yeah gordon yeah yeah, you know, I think the, there's, um, I think we mentioned earlier on about you're only a custodian mm. of the, this space and this, this place. And, and yeah, the people who came before um, are, you know, here in, 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 many, yeah. in many ways. And that could be trees that have been planted mm. um, many generations ago to hedgerows that have been built. Um, there's a huge story there to be uncovered. And, and yeah, you know, nine generations of mm -hmm. toil. Let's, yeah. let's face it, um, on the land and on the buildings, maintaining them. So we've had the opportunity to do something with them. So um, it does take, a, you know, an army to keep yeah. a place like this going, you know, either moving forward or even just maintaining its yeah. presence. So, um, yeah, the people that have, have, we're very lucky with the people who are working with us now. We've got mm -hmm. a fantastic team and those who have come before, we absolutely want to celebrate as well. But even walking around, it doesn't feel stuck in the past. It feels quite fresh. It has the gorgeous new oak barn just outside. And you were telling me all about how you stripped away the old timber area outside, but the castle used to live in the winter. Yeah. I loved to hear about your decision to sort of turn what was a very working farm into this um, space with event spaces, places for people to come together, to feast, to eat, to enjoy the space. Yeah, well, we started off, I mean, many farms have wonderful farm buildings. And actually, um, if you compare uh the nancaro farm buildings to others actually we, we probably didn't have as many gorgeous stone barns mm. as, as many but what we did have is one the old mill and that that's the space we sat in today and and it does have a great feel of feeling uh it's where we used to um mill all our corn and bring our harvest into um i remember sacks of field beans sat in the corner and rodents running around the place and and Lovely. you know dozens of buckets uh, catching the various uh, water from the various leaks in the roof um, but it, even then it had an amazing feeling mm. to be in here. And, and I remember going on holidays to France in Brittany in France um, as a kid and going to these places called Ferme Auberge, which is basically an open farm and, mm. and having really rustic dinners in these wonderful sort of stone, stripped back stone buildings. And, and they're still going now. And, and that was kind of the, the initial vision. And like anything, it sort of snowballs when you get going. And, and we um, started off this, with this wonderful building uh, we're lucky enough to build a, a sort of green oak frame sort of event space, which kind of, I suppose, catapulted us into the sort of bigger events. 
which is what you kind of need if you're if you're growing a lot of produce you do need a lot of people to sit there and enjoy it so um, there's that critical mass that's always important when it comes to producing uh, food um and, and then from then on we've kind of made it up as we've gone along and that's been led by some materials that we've had stashed um which have provided a you know framework for a building or um you know that an idea that somebody within the team's come up with it's it's um i love it here when i walk around um when the to-do list is small um <laughs> i also love it when uh, i look around and I, I and i know that each project in its own right um you know, it happened in a sequence, not necessarily a planned sequence, but it didn't all happen at once. And mm. I think sometimes when you go somewhere and it's all done and dusted and, and everywhere yeah. matches and everywhere has that feeling of of, of part of a mm. bigger piece, we've tried to, we've just done bits at a time. And each each year there's been a project, ten, that's tended to um, be either providing extra event space mm. or it might be um, providing facilities to link the, kitchen experience back to the farm and, and, and some of the things like the butchery and the bakery mm-hmm. in recent years, that's, that's been naturally providing facilities for those sort of um, processes to take place. But um, yeah, because it's happened in, in a sort of random order and every, every project has a slightly different feel to it, but it's kind of unified by mm. the fact that we've kind of reused materials. Yeah. Um, I feel it has much more of a, um, um, a what's the word? Um, it feels genuine, like genuine, yeah. sort of genuine. Like a, a, a old farmyards would have been built up that very mm, same way, yeah. where little funny little lean tos would have been built because they that, that served a purpose in the past. I uh, hope in a hundred years' time they look back at this place and they can kind of see all the various different quirks and wonky buildings and uh, you know unlevel floors and uh, you know mismatching gutterings or whatever it might be, <laughs> and actually kind of get a sense of the story we've um, yeah. been on in the last sort of 10 years. I think you can really feel that. Even the chicken shed, yeah. which is now the bridal suite, and yeah. it still has the chicken doors around the side. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's lovely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's um, yeah, we we've, we've definitely feel like over the, you know, different generations will have their fashions mm. and they'll have their things that they don't like. And those, that means history is sometimes lost, isn't it? Yeah. You know, and you get these wonderful little details that, that um, because one person didn't like them, they yeah. go. So we very much want to keep whatever's left, you know, um, you know, over the years, things have come and gone here as, as well as everywhere else. But we wanted to take everything that was, um, you know, had a little story or had a nice little quirk. We've kind of kept those. Uh, and yeah, little things like the chicken doors, it's just sort of, like, well, we could strip them away and, but actually they, yeah, they're not they're not causing any yeah, any harm being there exactly um so they stay i love it and let's talk about the space today and the kind of events or the the things that you throw to get people to come and visit to come and experience nankaro for themselves i know you do their feet you do feast days sunday yeah. lunches i'd yeah. love to hear about all of that yeah so um we have about fifteen thousand people uh, visiting the farm every year and and uh yeah one of the um I suppose what people know us for, I suppose, are the farm feasts. Mm-hmm. They've been really sort of um, well attended for many years now. And, and the idea of that is it's one menu. It's about 100, 100 odd people uh, sat at long tables next to strangers um, and with friends that they, they've, they've chosen to, <laughs> to buy tickets with as well, of course. But they, it's very much a kind of communal dining feel, live music. Um, so great food at the heart of it, of course, but the, actually that kind of that's lovely spirit and music and wood mm. smoke and, and um, just sort of merriment, um, which has a lo- just a lovely, uh, a lovely feeling. And they've, they've been going for, for 10 years now. We used to have them monthly and, and uh, they still are about monthly actually, but we've built in other, other events. So obviously during COVID, we couldn't have that communal dialing. People, people couldn't share mm-hmm. uh, bowls and pass around bowls to each other. So we moved to more of a restaurant mm-hmm. format. And actually, there are people out there who just want to go out to two or a four. They don't want to have to, you know, make the effort to talk to yeah. other people. And that's absolutely fine. Um, so we do our suppers as well. And and again, um, from a, a chef standpoint, it enables us to be a bit more stretching, mm-hmm. I suppose, with some of the food. Um, so only slightly less rustic, but a little bit less rustic than mm-hmm. the, the feasts. Um, and those are, yeah, the, the barn is set out just like a restaurant. So tables of two to ta- up to tables of eight. Um, and they're absolutely wonderful, maybe a little bit more civilized, I suppose, <laughs> than the feast. And then um, what's really um, 
come about in the last couple of years are our Sunday lunches. Um, people love the idea of being able to have some really good quality food and a stroll and yeah, have a kind of, uh, you know, a whole afternoon of, of, of sort of activity. So the Sunday roasts are really, really well attended. We have about 200 people coming when, whenever we put a Sunday roast on 200 or more. And that's fantastic for the farm, obviously. So if you think we're growing a lot of the veg and producing a lot of the meat that those people consume, it's, it's a fantastic way of, of kind of joining up that farm to that dining experience. We're very lucky in that respect. And those Sunday events are family friendly. Um, they have a kind of um, summer version, which is much more our own sourdough, some some lovely summery veg to go with our, our meat, and then and a lovely pud. And then in the um, kind of autumn winter months, those Yorkshire puddings come out and roast potatoes um, and real gravy and stuff like that. So much more traditional, but still a quality that you don't necessarily get elsewhere. So I think everyone thinks they can cook a good Sunday roast. And when you go to a pub, sometimes it's a bit disappointing, yeah. isn't it? Because of that. And, and I think what, what um, Jack and the team have done here is, is I find that balance that, that um, ensures people just want to continue to come back because actually those sides absolutely sing next to the meat. And yeah, um, yeah the more we grow here, the, the more I think people value that, that true sort of farm to table sort of feeling and i really um, love how even though you take the sunday right the sunday lunch it changes with the season and everything. absolutely yeah and i yeah. love that yeah and and we we there there is a sort of expectation really that people um are coming here with an open mind because mm -hmm. the menu they, they will be sent the menu beforehand but they're coming with a an open mind and maybe try stuff they wouldn't have tried mm -hmm. before or certainly things they wouldn't necessarily have choose to had it been on a menu and that's some of the feedback we often get that that it's an unexpectedly enjoying enjoyable experience because actually you are you're served what mm -hmm. we know tastes amazing yeah and yes people have different preferences actually but when they just suck it up with the whole experience then then they love it which i think segues really nicely into your thousand mouth events that you run um can you tell us a bit more about that yeah so the thousand mouths events we've done a two, two of them and, and i suppose they're our little sort of take on a festival Festivals are a frightening sort of thing to take on as a as a project because they are you know um, time consuming and 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 they can end up being a bit of a washout, can't they? So <laughs> what we've got here is some sort of unique um, uniqueness, I suppose, at Nancaro in that we've got all this produce, mm -hmm. and we've also got these wonderful spaces where we can actually feed a lot of people in various different spaces at the same time. So really create that kind of real unique dining experience. And the idea of Thousand Miles was was a, just an idea that came about in terms of um, communicating that nose to tail philosophy that we have day to day anyway. Um, it's where we live and breathe it because, um, you know, wastage is criminal on, on a farm. So, so um, you know, that, that's how our, our butchery works day to day, but it's a way in which we can really communicate that to a wider audience. audience. So um, the thousand miles idea was to take one bullock, you know, one of the best of the year, cause it's, you know, October time. Mm -hmm. So at the end of a really sort of uh, plentiful summer, um, so we take a really um, great bullock and feed a thousand people with him. Um, and that goes alongside all the veg that's peaking at the same sort of time. So it has that real lovely harvest festival sort of feel. Um, and and yeah, so we've we've done two of those and it's been the, the idea has been bringing in loads of local chefs. And that could be Dan Cox from Crockerton, mm -hmm. Paul Ainsworth from um, num number six. Um, and many others, um, and sort of collaborate on a, a real kind of lovely sort of mini festival, um, and draw people in that haven't necessarily been, been before. So, um, there's been a mixture of sort of fine dining, um, events that have linked into some of the prime cuts like Philip, for example, um, to other parts that, that kind of lend itself to more of a surf and turf or a real rustic kind of, um, uh, slow roast sort of experience. So, um, so yeah, really great opportunity to, to sort of yeah, collaborate with others and, and bring new people in to the fore and, and really kind of kind of show off what we actually do every week. Um, but but kind of make a more more of a kind of celebration around it. So I love I think celebrating local produce at its best in the area it's come from, this whole nose to tail, no waste. Absolutely. I think it's such an important philosophy. Yeah, I, you know, a lot a lot of um the issues, you know, facing our overconsumption mm. in this country um, around, you know, seasonality and people being flexible and 
you know, it's the way in which we've always lived in previous generations. It's, you know, the um, indigenous people who are managing their forests or savannas perfectly well because they are eating with the seasons. They're taking what they need, not what they want. And and I think, um, uh, yeah, our menus are, I say, they're always seasonal. You know, they're, they're um, there's, you know, you've got to take the rough with the smooth, haven't you? You know, um, at the moment we're obviously in absolutely peak. Abundance. Where we're enjoying these absolute beautiful, you know, the freshest tomatoes you can possibly imagine and the wonderful tender stem and stuff like that. And then there are times a year when you are, you know, you're looking at a turnip or a potatoes. celeriac <laughs> or a potato or a Jerusalem artichoke. But actually they've got their time and place and, and, and you can, you know, you can, you wouldn't necessarily always cook them at home. Mm. And I think that's the important thing about the kitchen here as well is that you, we do stretch people. And, um, you know, people come with that open mind typically, um, to be, to be stretched and to be surprised and, and absolutely in tune with the seasons. Yeah. And that links really love really well with your whole sustainability, organic focus. And you showed me earlier the composters. Yeah. uh, Like I said earlier, you know, waste is criminal really. Um, and you know, that's anything that is potential fertility, um, the whole idea of paying someone to take that away from the farm is just alien to, to any farmer really, but actually it's, it's day to day in a restaurant setting. So we're lucky because, you know, there's, there's a, a working farm running alongside a, a restaurant. So um, we have Rydan composters and, and they are um, fantastic for, to, for processing food waste and turning it into fantastic compost in a relatively short time. And it takes us about four to five months and, um, but yeah, go, it goes back to that whole idea of of, of closed loop, um, uh, and that could be any business really, any manufacturing business, but certainly on a farm, where fertility is is everything. You know, everything we do has, has there's a reason for it, and and um, you know, yeah, going back to that that statement of you know, waste is criminal. You yeah. know, we can't afford to you know, waste. And actually as a country, we can't afford to do that either, but we do. Um, but I think we've got more control of the whole, um, the whole process here. So, um, it, it means that people, you know, it may be a really sort of gross job at the end of the shift, but actually it's been processed by people who use that end product. Mm. So food waste, converting that into something which is of value, um, is, is, you know, really rewarding, yeah. you know, and the smell of this lovely sweet compost that actually was, food wastes you know a few months ago is 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 a great process and we've been doing now for um three or four years um and other restaurants are now taking that on Mm -hmm. obviously you need your space you need you know somewhere to put your compost after but but increasingly you know farm to table restaurants are are doing that sort of thing um and then the other the, the charcoal making that we do on site as well links into that um both from producing a cooking fuel um uh, which we use in that in our charcoal, which is better than any charcoal we could buy buy mm-hmm. otherwise. Um, but also creating biochar, um, which again is is a soil, soil amendment. Um, and again, it's all about you know locking that carbon and that fertility into our soil. Yeah, and that was amazing to see actually the buckets of scallop shells and oyster husks, and the yeah. fact that you can just carbonize them. Yeah, you know anything anything has carbon in it. So the 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 process of paralysis is is something which can be extended to anything really um your eye could be carbonized um but um but yeah no the 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 idea again is wherever possible um there's 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 something there that doesn't need to be waste it can be of value and you know if you were to go to a a garden center and try and lay your hands on some biochar uh, i think you know a few kilos probably 15 20 quid you know it's um it's it's a very valued resource and we've got it by by the sackful, yeah. as you saw. Um, so from a no dig um, gardener standpoint, that's that's something which really does, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's a great house for microbes and, and great for um, uh, moisture retention. So it really does does um, add an awful lot to the garden. Yeah. And we've got that coming through for free. It's taking a bit of time to process and a bit of love, but um, the, the thought that that could actually be um, you know, carted off yeah. and cost us money is, is insane when yeah. you think about it. Absolutely. And you said that Nankaro in its current form is 10 years in May. Was that right? T- yeah, 10 years in April next in year. April, but yeah. Happy birthday for then. And I'd love to know what does the next chapter look like to you? Yeah, well, I definitely feel um, as you sort of evolve as a, a new 
business and particularly one one like ours where we uh we didn't have any sort of big backers or anything like that this was a real family effort everyone sort of making sacrifices and and, mm-hmm. and going for it and, and so the first few years are definitely about survival and you know hitting certain milestones and and and, and not falling um, and we kind of reached that point and then we've had things like covid and the cost mm-hmm. of living crisis and stuff thrown in and, it's, and so it's been a a decade where we've um, we've survived and we've thrived and we've grown and, and we're really pleased and proud of where we've got to. I think going forward, you know, um, and the launch of our forest school or farm school next year, where we'll ha- start having more schools coming through the doors, um, is a real lovely kind of um, new chapter or mm. part of the new chapter where I feel just being a more of a pillar in the community is, is going to be the aim for the next 10 years. And, and we already have 15,000 people coming to the farm a year, which is way more than we could possibly have imagined. Um, but I think, you know, being, we can be something to a lot of different people. And the thought that, um, you know, a seven-year-old could be coming here and be inspired by nature and by where their food comes from and then going home and having that conversation with their parents and then coming and experiencing that themselves over lunch and then in later years who knows Bring you know children. exactly yeah. and 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 i think um you know we've got that genuine um heritage in terms of farming and in terms of you know farming in an ecological way um that you know i think we're in a genuine position to sort of just just be be who we are but be that but be that for many and that be that kind of pillar in the community and i think that's Going forward, I think that's that's got to be the aim, and and whether that's new spaces or growing more or having more people over, it's it's really just being accessible for as many people as possible. Really lovely, and a really lovely note to end this chat on. But before we do go, we've got time for a quick round of Steve's dream spaces. So, money's of no object. You've just won the lottery, cashing in that check. <laughs> Um, you can pick anywhere in the world, it can be a particular space, maybe somewhere you've been, somewhere you want to go. I'm going to ask you to choose three spaces. The first uh, one would be somewhere you want to escape and get away from it all. Somewhere, um, I have, obviously haven't prepared an answer for these. No, this I is, don't uh, tell you this about this This caught, caught me by surprise. <laughs> so I, when someone says that to me, I probably think of a little cottage by a river. Gorgeous. Somewhere. Any particular uh, part of the world? Or? Well, um, the Helford is very nice in Cornwall. Um, particularly, not very adventurous, is it, when it's only half an hour away from here? No, I like but that. But that's probably more yeah. achievable. Nine generations, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You can be there and back in an afternoon. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think a, a cottage by the river sounds good to me. Gorgeous. Okay. And this next one is your ultimate birthday party. Uh, the ultimate birthday party probably involves, um, I always think that you can kind of judge the success of a summer by number of times you play cricket across multiple generations so young and old all playing together so i would say some sort of barbecue slash picnic with some sort of game of cricket involved lovely you're the first person to bring cricket into dream spaces um and then finally so it's your bucket list trip trip of a lifetime where are you going have you got your eye on anywhere special to stay um nope <laughs> <laughs> i'll be uh, here no, well, there's, well there's two places that uh, uh lucy my wife is, and i've always wanted to go to costa rica lovely whether that ever happens i don't know um i and but i think it's our obviously 10 year anniversary as a business next year it's our 15th year wedding anniversary as well and i think we're planning on trying to take the kids to italy Gorgeous. Somewhere in Italy oh, would be nice. Have to go and see the agro turismo. Yeah. Get yes, some inspo. Ex- exactly, exactly. Love. Try and keep work out of the equation, but yeah, always, always. Love it. Oh, always well, thank you, Steve. It's been such a pleasure. Thank, thank you for you. bringing this space to life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Curated Spaces podcast. For more information and content around any of the spaces we feature, head to our website or Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to have new episodes delivered straight to your inbox every Wednesday. And if there's a special place in your life that you'd like to hear on the Curator Spaces podcast, please do get in touch as we're always on the lookout for more brilliant spaces to share with the world.